started yet, Peter? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today in what is the first Cambridge online MENA experience. Um, although MENA might be misleading because we have people from all over the world joining us in, and it's, it's, it's so amazing. People from Mexico and the U.S. in the middle of their nights. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a truly encouraging and, and, and stunning response that we've had to this. Uh, my name is, is Matthew Santisperit. I'm the regional manager for the MENA team uh, based in Dubai. So I'm sitting in what somewhat sunshine here in a hazy day. Um, I'm guessing the majority of us are all at home, uh, many listening with family in the vicinity. And I know these past few months have been strange and difficult. So as we navigate this unknown together, I think I want to stress that we are a community and that we remain a, a community, that we will continue to de dedicate ourselves to the process of learning and development, supporting teachers, instructors, and students in, in the best way that we can. I think it's what we do best at Cambridge and, and it's what we're gonna keep doing. So over the next two weeks, uh, Cambridge is hosting 13 individual, individual sessions delivered by 10 of the world's leading professional learning and development experts. I'm not gonna run through all their bios now. You can go to the website and have a look, but I'd like to thank all these wonderful speakers and educators for, to, for participating in, in what is really a truly unique webinar series. Uh, a special thanks goes to the man of the hour, Peter Lucantoni, for being the driving force behind the project. He's tireless in his, in his dedication to the cause. He's rounded up speakers and will also be delivering three fantastic webinars, the first of which you've all tuned in for this morning or this evening, wherever you may be. Uh, I'd also like to thank our colleagues at Cambridge Assessment English, especially Karen and Anna Maria for helping us put this together so quickly and for reaching out to their networks and getting so many of you involved. And finally, a huge amount of thanks to our, our own marketing guru, Raz, who's, uh, who's on the call with us today and helping us handle all the technical aspects of this. Um, again, without him putting together all the marketing materials and, the, and, the, and getting the technology sorted, this, this wouldn't have come together. So just a bit of quick housekeeping before Peter launches in. Um, and before my loaf of bread is ready to come out of the oven, because I've taken to baking these days, um, everyone's mic will be muted, but you can use the chat box to ask questions through the presentation. And for Peter. Raz, I think you muted me, dude. Okay. Um, and the only other bit, is at the end of the presentation, there will be a QR code that you can scan and get your certificate of attendance. Uh, and then we'll also post the link for that. And we'll also post the link for the recording. So it is being recorded. Um, if you do have to go halfway through, I've seen a few of those comments, then just keep the screen up to the end. You can click on your QR code or link, and then we can also watch the remaining bit um, on the recording. So I think that is all for me. Um, this is Peter's first session, learning strategies for learners. And I think all of you who know Peter know how uh, fantastic he is. And for those of you who don't, you're gonna get a first chance. So over to you, Peter. Great, thanks very much, Matt. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everybody from all over the world. I can see we've got uh, nearly 1,300 of you uh, in attendance this morning. So thanks very much uh, for being here with us today. Um, the first uh, webinar in, in our series is uh, Future Learners Need uh, Learning Strategies. And I think uh, the title is particularly relevant for us in these troubled times that we're all facing at the moment. Um, yes, we're all having to deal with the here and the now, but I think we also have to uh, be very aware that um, this storm will pass and um, things will um, obviously be different in the future, but I guess we'll also go back to some sort of uh, normality, something that we're more comfortable with uh, once this is all over. Um, so we're going to have a think about um, learners of the future and how uh, learning strategies can actually uh, help our learners and indeed help us uh, in, in, in the days ahead. So just very quickly, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Lucantoni, that's an Italian surname. Uh, my dad was Italian, but my mum is English. 
I was born in the UK. I was educated there. Um, I, I, I grew up there, spent a lot of my early years there, but um, I left in the, in the mid 1980s and I haven't lived in the UK since then. And in the interim, you know, my whole career has been in uh, English language teaching. I've been a teacher like many of you here today. I've also owned my own uh, language school and teacher training center. Again, I'm sure some of you are in the same position. Um, I've been and I still am a teacher trainer. I'm, I'm an author. I write books for uh, Cambridge University Press. And uh, currently I'm the professional learning and development manager for the, for the MENA region. I've also got a background with Cambridge um, assessment with SALT uh, Young Learners and SALTA. Uh, and I also used to be um, a, a, a Delta trainer. But let's move swiftly on to um, what it is that I want to talk about this morning. And there's basically uh, four main things that I want to talk about as well as having uh, a conclusion. And we're gonna start by having a think about uh, learning uh, and what the word learning actually means and then we're going to move on to thinking about learning strategies and as I said in the introduction thinking about the future and the particular challenges um, that, that we all face and try to come up with some sort of idea of, of what a future learner uh, actually is and then we'll make our conclusions so let's let's begin with a question um, and I'm quite happy uh, for you to type a few words in the chat box if you want to, but I'm just going to give you a very short amount of time to think about um, this question, which is, what does the word learning mean to you? So I'm just going to give you 30 seconds. Just type a few words uh, in, in, the, in the chat box. What does the word learning mean to you? Yeah, some great answers coming in. Amazing. Yeah, great. Knowledge, skills, information, enhancing, acquisition, self-developing, change. Excellent. Brilliant. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, stop, stop, stop. No more. No more. Um, that, that, of course, there isn't a, a, a right or a wrong answer to the question. It, it, it's how we all uh, interpret it. And what I'd like to do um, is to bring in some people who've said particular things about learning, um, um, not just recently, but, but also thousands of years ago. So my talk this morning is, is really based on, on these people that you can see coming up in the screen, because we're going to refer uh, to each of these uh, people who you can see on your screen at the moment. We've got 12 people who've said something particularly relevant about learning, and which um, I find particularly interesting and, and certainly relevant to what we're talking about this morning. Um, I wish I could say to you, we have prizes, if, if you could tell me who all of these people are. Uh, I'm sure some of the faces may be familiar. I'm sure some um, you've probably never uh, seen before, but um, hopefully uh, by the end of the webinar, you'll have a better understanding of, of, of who these people are. Uh, and also indeed, you know, why I think they're particularly important. So our first one then, uh, this gentleman here. Um, Please don't write anything in the chat box. You don't need to tell me who it is, but this is actually uh, the Greek philosopher Plato, um, who was uh, on, on the planet about two and a half thousand years ago. And um, Plato said this, and I've removed one word from the end of the quote. Uh, and I'd like you to have a think um, about what that uh, missing word is. And now you can uh, put it in the chat box. No, it's not Aristotle, it's Plato. And he said that, um, we should never discourage anyone who continually makes progress, no matter how, what? What's the missing word? Yeah, loads and loads of people are putting small, slow, slow. Slow seems to be the, uh, the favorite answer. Yeah, and I, I, I think um, that, that's, that's great that, that, that you've, you, you've got the word which is missing. Let's not discourage anyone who continually makes progress, no matter how slow. And I think in our, in our profession as educators, as, as, as teachers, we do tend sometimes to, to look at slowness as, as a, a negative um, attribute in, in, in the classroom. If, if a student is not working at the speed that we want them to work at, if, if they're working more slowly, then we do sometimes see that uh, as a negative. But I think we need to look at it from a different perspective and, and understand that some students just need a little bit more time. And perhaps if we gave some of our students a bit more time, possibly a bit more thinking time, a little bit more time to 
uh, to understand whatever the instructions are or to come up with the answer, they may actually be able to, uh, to, to, to reach the conclusion that we want them to reach. Okay, the second person that I want to show you is uh, this lady here. Again, I don't expect you to have any idea who it is. Uh, of course, you may do, but um, this is um, an American lady um, who died uh, about uh, 10 years ago. And she was um, an American physicist. And she won uh, the Nobel Prize for Medicine uh, back in 1977. And her name is Rosalind uh, Yalo. And uh, she said this, and again, there's a word missing, so you can type in the chat box um, if you have any idea what you think the missing word is. This is what she said. The something of learning separates youth from old age. As long as you're learning, you're not old. Yeah, hunger's a great word, isn't it? Hunger, love, joy, process, wonder, miracle, art. These are really great words that you're, you're coming up with. Excellent, yeah. Very nice, yeah. I, I haven't yet seen the exact word that she said, but you've got, you've got the meaning. What she actually said was, the excitement of learning separates youth from old age. As long as you're learning, you're not old. And I think excitement is, is a key element of what we should be doing in, um, when we're uh, in, in the context of education. Um, how are we exciting our students? Because I think, um, as, as, as Rosalind Yellow says, if, if we're excited, um, then, then we're probably going to be learning to, to a lesser or greater uh, degree. So let, let's keep the excitement in the learning. Uh, the next one I want to show you is um, um, a gentleman who's an educational consultant and, and, and speaker. Um, I've been searching very hard to find out more information about him. Um, indeed, you know, his, when he was born, I know he's still alive. I know he works with the Ministry of Education in Qatar. Um, as a consultant. Uh, this, this gentleman is called uh, Tom Whitby. Um, beyond that, I, I can't find out very much more about him, but um, here he is. I love his shirt, and this is what he says. And again, there's a word missing. What do you think the missing word is? Yep, I can see the answer coming in. Excellent. Okay, you've already got it. Very, very good. The answer is goal. That's what he said. But aim um, is, 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 is just as good. So teaching kids, I guess, let's change that for teaching students. It doesn't, they don't have to be kids. But teaching kids how to learn becomes much more important than teaching them what to learn when the goal is lifelong learning. And I think this is particularly relevant for us now. Um, when we're having to rethink how we actually teach our students and indeed how they learn. I've been having lots of conversations with teachers over the last couple of weeks and everybody is uh, very concerned and um, lacking in confidence about how to move from the classroom to an online teaching context. But one of the things that I keep reminding everyone of, let's not forget the students because they're also having to uh, face a different learning, um, a different way of learning um, it's not just the students who know, who know sorry, it's not just the teachers uh, who, know, who are no longer in the classroom, it's the students as well. So let's not forget that they also um, are struggling and probably lacking in confidence. So I think Tom Whitby's um, um, words here are, are particularly relevant um, given the current situation. Uh, the fourth one I want to show you, um, the fourth and final one for this, this part of the talk um, is... Um, uh, this gentleman here, um, actually very famous um, in the 1960s in particular, um, this is uh, John Gardner, and he was the USA Secretary of Health and Education uh, when President uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, was, was in the White House. Um, and uh, Gardner was alive um, until, uh, until uh, 2002. And um, Gardner said this, which again I think is particularly relevant uh, to what we're talking about this morning. He said that one of the reasons people stop learning is that they become less and less willing to risk what? What do you think he said? Challenge, nice, yeah. Failure, nice. Challenge, failure, life, okay. Yep, yep, 
lovely, excellent. Uh, he actually said failure. And I think um, those of you who are with us today who, who've learned English as a second or indeed a third language will know that the reason that you're so competent um, is the fact that you risked failure. Uh, you, you, weren't, you weren't worried about making mistakes. You weren't worried about being wrong. You weren't worried about being embarrassed. Um, and we, we know that we learn through failure. We learn through making mistakes. So I've taken those four people, uh, those four um, quotations, if you prefer, in order to kickstart what we want to talk about. Um, and I think that um, given the situation that we're all in nowadays, I think it's, it's time to have a, um, a picture. And I hope you can all see my, <clears throat> my picture, which is a bridge going across um, what? I don't know. I don't know what's underneath the bridge. Maybe a river, maybe a stream, maybe a canyon, maybe rocks. Uh, I don't know what's underneath it, but we know that the, uh, the bridge um, is taking us there. Somebody's saying it's an endless bridge. Um, that's, that, that's the whole point here. It's, it's an endless bridge and we don't know where it goes uh, and the future is unknown. And the reason I have that there is because I want to use it as an introduction to my fifth um, person. Um, this gentleman over on the, uh, the left of your screen um, is uh, Jerome Bruner, who I'm sure many of you have heard of. Maybe you've studied him. Uh, Jerome Bruner was uh, an American cognitive psychologist and educator who lived to a wonderful age, 101 years old when he died. Um, he only died uh, four years ago, um, but uh, an amazing, amazing person. And, and the reason that he's there and the reason that we have this picture is because of something he said, which is this. So learning should not only take us somewhere, it should allow us later to go further more easily. And I think if I can interpret Jerome Bruner's words correctly, what he's saying is learning shouldn't just be about the here and the now. Whatever we're learning today should be helping us to move on somewhere in the future. And I think, and this is not a criticism of, of anyone, but I, I think in, in many ways, it's, in many situations, it's true that we're, we are teaching for, for the here and the now, for the test, uh, for whatever it is that we're going to test them on tomorrow, uh, rather than thinking um, through to the future. And I think this, is, this leads us very nicely into how we actually do the learning how the students actually do the learning and, and how that's linked in uh, with what we need to do as teachers. So addressing the, uh, the second point um, in our uh, talk this morning is, is what's a learning strategy. The gentleman on the right is not one of my 12 uh, famous people at the beginning, so don't worry trying to guess who it is. Um, he's just somebody that we've, we've used. Um, but I want you to think now about, about what a learning strategy actually is. And again, I've given you one example. Could you again, um, please write a couple of uh, things in the chat box? Uh, Raz, somebody's saying they can't see the picture. Could you, could you help them, please? Thanks. So we've got lots of nice ideas coming up. Targets, progress, method, lovely. Some really nice ideas here. The way to approach a lifelong journey. Yep, great. And I would probably add to the word um, process um, that maybe it's a pathway, maybe it is about uh, reaching goals. Raz, a couple of people are saying in the chat box that they can't, um, they can't see the slides. Oh. I'll help them out, Peter. Okay, thanks very much, Raz. Thanks. No problem. No. Okay, so a learning strategy then is, 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 is many things, it's procedures, it's experiments, and, and as with my questionnaire about what's learning, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, it, it's just our own individual interpretation, interpretation um, of it. But I want to have a look um, by going back to my experts uh, and, and seeing what they have to say about it. So this gentleman, um, he's not uh, Plato. This is another uh, Greek philosopher. Uh, this is actually Sophocles, um, who lived around about the same time um, as Plato, whom we saw earlier, uh, about two and a half thousand years ago. And He's there because of this. Look, look at his words.
Now, we often think about, you know, learning by doing um, and, and thinking about things uh, as, as, a, as a 20th century um, idea or approach. Um, but this was being uh, talked about and it was, it was known even two and a half thousand years ago. One must learn by doing the thing, for though you think you know it, you have no certainty until you actually try. In other words, you can sit and you can listen, but that doesn't actually mean uh, that you've necessarily learned anything. What you really need to do is actually try it. You, you need to be doing the things uh, that, that you've been taught. And that leads very nicely uh, into number seven, which is this gentleman here, who you may recognize from the um, American banknote. This gentleman over here, he's even got his name down the bottom here. This is, of course, uh, Benjamin Franklin. And uh, Benjamin Franklin was one of the uh, founding fathers, and he was involved in, in drafting, putting together the, uh, the Declaration of, of Independence, uh, and of course, the Constitution uh, of, the, of the United States. Please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not very good on American history. And the reason that Benjamin Franklin is up there is because he said, this and I'm only going to show you the first line and I'm sure when you see the first line uh, you'll know what um, the next two lines are so the first line is this tell me and I forget now you don't need to write in the textbooks but uh, you can just think of what the next two lines are I'm sure you've seen this or a variation of it Yeah, some of you are writing in the box. You don't need to, don't worry. I'm going to put it up on the screen. The second line of, of this is, tell me and I forget, and of course, teach me, and I may remember. So we need to understand that there's a difference between telling somebody something and teaching somebody something. And so, of course, the third one must be getting, getting me to actually do it, involving me, as Sophocles said. I need to learn by doing something. So the third line here is involving me and I learn. So I think in answer to the question at the top of the screen, what's a learning strategy? We're beginning to understand that a learning strategy must involve the student actually doing something. That's one of the key aspects of, of a learning strategy. So far, we haven't actually... Um, we, or we have, I haven't used any uh, words from any... Uh, ELT uh, experts. Uh, they've, they've all been people in, in um, different professions. So I'd like now to turn to looking at um, some of the experts in, 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 in English language teaching, people who you may be a bit more familiar with than the ones we've already seen. Uh, and this gentleman here is somebody whom um, I spent a lot of time reading um, when I was younger uh, because Vivian Cook, as this is, uh, Vivian Cook um, is a, a great uh, ELT expert, um, has produced, written a lot of work uh, around our profession and in particular about learners and, and the strategies that they use. And something that Vivian Cook said is this. So a learning strategy refers to a choice that the learner makes while learning or using language. And I've underlined the word choice because it's obviously the key word uh, in that particular quote from Vivian Cook. So a learning strategy refers to a choice that the learner makes. Of course, the problem here is that learners can only make a choice if they have a menu uh, to choose from. And I think we all know that learning strategies, uh, we're not born with learning strategies, we're not born with the ability to do things in a particular way. Uh, we have to learn uh, how to do particular things. We have to learn how to tie our shoes. Uh, we have to learn um, how to boil an egg. We have to learn how to brush our teeth and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that the, the same is true in, in the language classroom. It's a task which we, the teachers, have. We have to help our learners to understand what the best learning strategies are for particular tasks that they're confronted with. And it's only by um, our teaching that the students will eventually have a menu which, from which they can make uh, a choice. And I'd like to show you now um, a lady um, who works in the Faculty of Education um, at the University of Cambridge in the UK, a lady called Madeleine 
um, hunter. And again, I think uh, this is particularly relevant uh, for us in the situation which, which we're in now. It's a slightly longer uh, quotation from Madeleine Hunter, but so I'll just leave you to read it. And this, of course, links back nicely to what we've just seen from Vivian Cook about choice. We must provide learners with a choice in, in how to do something. Um, all, not, all, not all children are going to want to do things in the same way. Uh, I'm sure you know, in other, on other occasions you've learned a lot about learning styles. You're probably familiar with Howard Gardner and the audio child and the, and the, the visual child and the kinesthetic child and the musical child, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that the, the, the point here is, if, you know, looking back to what Vivian Cook said, we, we, we've got to give learners choices. We, we can't be dogmatic about the way that things go on in the classroom. I mean, currently we have this wonderful uh, opportunity to look at this um, in, in, in far more detail. We've moved children from the classroom to an online learning context um, and, and of course the teachers as well and I'm sure you're finding that some children who may be in the classroom, in the physical classroom, were not performing in the way that you want them to but maybe now that they're in um, an online situation uh, they're a completely different character. So just shifting the mode of learning from face to face to uh, uh, remote learning may have uh, an amazing impact on children. On the other hand, some children who perform well in the classroom, you may find are not performing so well uh, when they're taught remotely. And the same, of course, is true of teachers. Many teachers may be, um, excel in the classroom when they're face to face with their students but put them into a, a situation where they're having to teach um, through a screen uh, maybe uh, they're, they're feeling that they lack confidence so we need teaching strategies different teaching strategies just as much as learners need learning strategies so let's have a look at another um, ELT expert um, this, this gentleman is so famous, I'm sure many of you know who it is. So let's just type your answers. Anybody know who this is? This gentleman over on the right, who's this? Anybody know? Richard, yeah, that's half correct. No, it's not Vivian Cook, Covey, no. Richards, yeah, this is actually Jack Richards. Um, very, very famous uh, ELT specialist, uh, the backbone of communicative language teaching, uh, the, the, the writer and uh, co-writer of many, many very, very successful uh, course books, for example, Interchange and Four Corners. Uh, Interchange is probably one of the most famous uh, course books of all time. And I'm going to put on the screen um, what Jack Richards has to say about a learning strategy. But um, just to keep you on your toes, um, I've jumbled up the words, so I'd like you to unjumble uh, the words. And um, if, if you wish, you can you can put your answers uh, in the chat box. So here are the jumbled words. Remember, they're jumbled, so they don't make sense. You need to unjumble them. Here we go. So I'll give you thirty seconds. Have a think about the words and type your answers in the chat box. You need to make one sentence. A couple of people can't see the slides, and I think uh, Raz is, is helping you with that. Okay, so let's have a look. I, I can see uh, a couple of uh, correct answers. So well done, the people that got it right. And even if you didn't, it doesn't matter. But this is what Jack Richards said in, in response to the question, what is a learning strategy? Jack Richards said, it's what learners do in order to achieve 
successful learning. It's the things that learners do to achieve successful learning. Now, if you think about um, the task that I just set you, if I just remove the answer and go back to the words in red, you, everybody who's here, everybody who attempted this, used a particular strategy to unjumble those words. Now, I'm sure many of you use the same strategy, but I'm sure others used a slightly different strategy. And the same is true of our learners. I didn't say to you, you must do, uh, you must find the solution by using this particular strategy. Um, I just gave you the task to do. So this is a, a, just a little example of, of how we all use different strategies uh, in order to come up with answers. I'm sure many of you looked at the word what and thought it was a question because also we have the word do as a helping word. So maybe some of you were thinking, what do, what do, ah, what do learners, what do learners? And then you realize that actually um, it doesn't work um, as, as, as a question. Okay, so returning to um, this gentleman, and this of course is Vivian Cook, and Vivian Cook talks specifically about language learners, um, and he said this. So he's making the point that if you're good at something, I mean, obviously Vivian Cook is talking about language learning and that's what we're all uh, involved in. But I think um, we can say that people who are good at anything, whether it's um, language or making a cake or driving a car, playing the piano, public speaking, whatever it might be. Um, but if you're good at something, then when you're learning, when you're developing that particular skill, you approach it in a different way from those who are actually not so good, who are less, who are less competent or um, we behave um, in different ways, but, sorry, we behave in the same way, but we do it in a more um, efficient way. Uh, L2 is your second language. So L1 is your, your first language, the language that you probably um, use at home, mostly L2 is your uh, second language. So for, for most people today, I think um, L2 would be um, uh, learning English. Um, possibly in some context, uh, English may be learned as a third language, so we could have uh, L3 as well. So let's just make sure we understand what Vivian Cook is saying. If you're good at something, you're probably going to get better because of the way that you approach uh, the learning of that particular skill. Uh, we're talking about language here. And I think if you think about your students uh, in, a, in a typical classroom, the good students just get better. And sometimes it happens even without you having to have much uh, interference in the learning process. And I want to show you one more person who I'm sure to many of you will be very, very famous. Anybody know who this is? Yeah, Bahador has got the answer. This is Jeremy Harmer. Yeah, uh, Jeremy Harmer. And um, Jeremy Harmer says this, or said this. So the teacher has to encourage students to develop learning strategies, which will involve actually training students to behave in certain ways. Now think about your classrooms. How many times have you said to students, do this, do that, underline the key words, just, just skim read the text. You don't need to read everything. You don't need to understand every word. Take notes as you read, take, take notes as, as, as you listen. Uh, ask your partner, use a dictionary. All of these things that you're saying to your students, these are all learning strategies. Students don't know that they should be doing these things unless we actually encourage them. And as Harma says, it's actually about training your students to behave in particular ways, making it clear to them what's going to work and what won't actually work. And if we're not doing that, then we're not gonna be able to provide uh, students with the menu, with the choice, uh, that Vivian Cook mentioned earlier. Remember, Vivian Cook said that a learning strategy refers to a choice that the learner makes while learning or using uh, a language. The challenge for everybody, um, us and the students, is that um, they don't have a choice. Uh, they can't develop a choice unless we actually train the students to behave uh, in certain ways. So this, this, this can, of course, involve uh, self-questioning. So here's our 
student in the middle and a student might be asking themselves what do I need to do to answer this question but of course that's only half of it they also need to know the answer don't they or the possible answers so if a student is sitting there saying to themselves what do I need to do to answer this question um, I don't know then of course we have a problem but through training as Harmer says we can get students to come up with possible answers do I need to skim do I need to scan do I need to write notes? Do I need to use online resources? So, you know, through training over time, we can provide students with that menu. We can provide them with the options uh, from which to choose in order to be successful with a particular task. Just another example, how can I understand more when I listen? This is the question the student is asking. And again, we want them to be in a situation where they have an answer to that particular question. So, for example, here it could be memorize, relax, focus, remove distractions, look for ideas, not just words, and so on and so forth. So by training our students, which is what Harmer says, training students to behave in certain ways, one of these is to get them to uh, ask each other questions. Sorry, to ask themselves uh, a particular question. And once students become more confident, once they begin to understand better, um, about uh, what works, then they don't need to answer the question. The learning strategy will become an automatic reflex. They won't need to think, you know, how do I do this? What do I need to do? Um, how can I be more effective? It will just uh, happen automatically. And of course, once a student gets to that point, then um, they will become much, much more confident. So here's a beautiful picture of Cambridge in better days, even though there's no people. But look at that, isn't that a beautiful scene? But the reason that's there is because I want to talk about uh, this gentleman again. And this of course is Jerome Bruner. And moving a little bit away from uh, learning strategies now and thinking more about uh, the future and, and how we learn and what's important, um, Jerome Bruner said this, And I think this links in nicely with what we were just saying about um, students self-questioning. We want our students to, 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 to think. And, and Bruner is saying that the actual process of thinking about my thinking um, is definitely going to um, empower me. So we, the teachers, we, the educators, the administrators, the stakeholders, just as much as the students uh, need to be thinking uh, about thinking. And that nicely brings me to um, one further expert um, who I wanted to uh, use in this talk this morning. And this gentleman over on the right, uh, a gentleman called uh, Andreas Schleicher. Now, Andreas Schleicher is the director for the Directorate of Education and Skills uh, within the um, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And Andreas Schleicher produced um, a wonderful uh, paper called The Case uh, for 21st Century Learning. And within that paper, um, Schleicher said this, that a generation ago, teachers could expect that what they taught would last their students a lifetime. And I, I think about myself when I was at school, um, we didn't have the rapid change um, the rapid changes that, that we experience uh, today, um, particularly in the, in the area of technology, but, but in, in many other areas as, uh, as well. And he goes on to say that nowadays, because there's so much uh, economic and social change, and it's all happening so very, very quickly, schools, but indeed uh, colleges, universities, we have to prepare students for the future. And he, um, uh, Schleicher, specifies three particular areas that he thinks um, we need to prepare students for. Um, so again, use the chat box if, if you want to, and uh, let me know what you think uh, the three things might be. I'm gonna give you a little bit of help. So the first one begins with J. Any idea what that might be? What do we have to prepare students for? Joy, I like that from David, yeah, joy, but um, okay. Jobs, I can see. Jobs, 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 and joy. Journey of life. Lovely. Great answers. Brilliant. The second one is um, T. 
Any ideas for tea? What do we have to prepare students for? Tactics, nice word from Homer. Great, technology, technology's thinking. Yeah, lovely, good. And the third one, something beginning with P. Any ideas? Positive, yeah. Yeah, practice, great, good, lovely. Nice ideas. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, what Schleicher actually said. Uh, the first one, as you correctly got, was jobs. We need to prepare students for jobs that have not actually yet been created. We don't have time today, but I'm sure um, if we put our heads together, uh, we would come up with a whole list of jobs that haven't actually yet been created, but which are based on what we think uh, will be our uh, future needs. Um, I want to, didn't want to talk about our current um, coronavirus situation, but I think there are people doing things today that they never thought uh, they would be doing um, even two or three months ago uh, based on um, a current need. So the T, uh, the T was technologies. Uh, and he says, technologies that have not yet been invented. So we need to start thinking um, about technologies that may be here uh, in the future. Again, we don't have time to, to come up with a list, but um, I think it's, it's, it's indeed very, very true. Um, certainly when I was at school, that you know, the, the, the change, the growth in technology was incredibly slow. I don't remember things moving and changing. I can remember having the same uh, television at home for, for many, many years. It just didn't change. Also having the same telephone, um, you know, before mobiles were invented. Um, the same telephone with a dial in my house with my mum and dad and my family. It was there for, for years and years and years. Imagine having the same mobile phone uh, for years and years. In fact, you know, the, the companies that make mo mobile phones, they don't allow us to have the same phone. Um, so I think that second point about technology um, is, is, is particularly important. And the third thing that he says we need to prepare um, students for is uh, the problems that we don't yet know will actually arise. So Batul is saying, yeah, in the chat box, problems that might take place in the, in the, in the future. Yeah, yeah. So our job as educators nowadays is actually to, to try to anticipate uh, what's going to happen in the future um, in these three particular areas. What, what, what jobs may students need to be ready for? Uh, what technologies are coming along? And indeed, uh, what are the problems um, that may appear uh, in the future? And Schleicher goes on to talk about how we can be successful. And, and he makes the point that if you're not prepared to change, if you're not prepared to um, open up, then of course, um, you're not going to be helping your students to prepare for the future. So he, he in fact said this, that success is gonna to go to those individuals and countries that are swift to adapt. In other words, they're quick to adapt, they're fast to adapt, they don't resist and they're open to change. And the task of everyone is to help countries to rise to this particular challenge. And I think certainly in, um, in the Middle East region, we're seeing this um, in, uh, in various countries which are adopting um, uh, vision and, and, and policy changes um, which, which address uh, the three challenges that, that Schleicher identified in jobs, technologies, and, and problems. And an enormous amount of investment is being made um, into preparing the country and therefore its people uh, for the future. So Schleicher says that um, if we want our learners to be ready for the future, uh, they need to be strategy-based. In other words, they need to have the tools that we talked about earlier. They need to have that menu. They need to have those, all of those options. Um, and he says that the, uh, the future learners, they need to be monitoring what they're doing and responding appropriately based on, um, on, on their self-monitoring. And learners need to understand who they are. They need to understand how they learn and what they're learning for uh, and, and, and indeed why they're learning. And a third point that he makes is, is, I think it's very important, I think we sometimes forget it um, when we're in the classroom, but everything we're teaching students needs to be applied um, to 
uh, different situations and, and different areas in which they can uh, perform. And he goes on um, to, to, to make the point that being a future learner is also about caring. It's, it's caring about uh, other people and, and understanding that when we learn, whether it's in the classroom or, or even online, which, which often feels very lonely, but learning um, has to be social and it has to be uh, collective. So as teachers, I think we need to be constantly trying to um, create opportunities for learning to be um, a, a social activity and indeed a collective activity and it's 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 more of a challenge for us isn't it nowadays when uh, we're having to teach remotely he also makes the point and we, we mentioned this earlier um, when we talked about uh, failure um, and um, it was, it was John Gardner who talked about uh, risking failure. Uh, Schleicher says that we need to make sure that we learn, not, not only from our own mistakes, but also from the mistakes that other people uh, make. And the last point I want to cover here, um, <laughs> I think, again, it's very, very relevant to the situation that we find ourselves in now. Um, there's no point in being negative or pessimistic about our current situation. I think what we need to do um, is, is accept that we're no longer in schools, we're no longer in classrooms, uh, and we need to do something about it, as, as I'm sure you all are. And, you know, this webinar today and indeed over the next couple of weeks is a, is a clear indication um, that, that we are actually doing something about it. So uh, I'm coming to the close um, of, of my uh, talk this morning, and um, I want to show that picture again because I think it's so beautiful. Happy days are ahead, I promise you. But at the top of the screen, it says that the University of Cambridge wants to do something. And the thing that the University of Cambridge wants to do is to encourage students to see what everyone else has seen. In other words, open your eyes and look at what's already here. But there is a but. And the but is that we also want students, and of course this won't be everybody, it can't be everybody, but what we also want is for students to think what nobody else has actually thought. And this links us back um, to what uh, we heard earlier about we need to think uh, about thinking. This is what Jerome Bruner said, that thinking about thinking has to be a principal ingredient of any empowering practice um, of education. So we need to get our students to think about uh, what nobody else has thought. So I have an open-ended question now to show you, and another picture. You can see I'm a visual learner. So to create future learners, teachers should what? You don't have to answer. Please, please don't uh, uh, start writing answers because we, we don't have the time to look at them all. But just, just think about that open question there. To create future learners, teachers should do what? And I want you to, uh, to take that away. Um, I must admit, when I was thinking about it, uh, I myself had um, had a thought, um, another thought. <laughs> so um, instead of this being the final thought, I have a final, final thought. And uh, I want to return to my friend uh, Plato. And um, if I can just give you a little very, very short uh, story here. A couple of years ago, I was um, doing some uh, work with teachers in Italy. And uh, we were talking about to, uh, on uh, learner, about learner strategies and uh, they were the teachers were doing uh, an activity and I'd stopped uh, monitoring them and I just looked at a notice board and I saw a picture of Plato on the, on the wall and underneath the picture of Plato was something written uh, in Italian. Now I'm pretty certain we don't have anybody uh, actually in Italy at the moment, but maybe there are some people in the room that know a little bit of Italian. But even if you don't, I want to show you um, what was written on the wall. Now, obviously, Plato didn't write this in Italian. He wrote it in ancient Greek, but it, it had been uh, translated uh, into Italian for uh, people to understand. So this is, this is what Plato said two and a half thousand years ago, translated into Italian. He said, bello e il rischio della scoperta. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. And uh, anybody want to have a quick guess? I'm sure you all know what the word bello means. Rischio sounds like an English word. 
scoperta is a bit difficult. Anybody I'll tell you what's uh, a rough translation because it's, it's sort of poetic, but um, my, my interpretation and also um, one of my uh, colleagues in, in, in Italy uh, says this, there's a hidden beauty in the risk of discovery which I think is beautiful and I think it really uh, summarizes everything that we've been talking about um, and in particular the fact that we want to encourage our students to take risks, we want to encourage our students uh, to make discoveries because through taking risks and, and through making discoveries uh, there's definitely a hidden beauty and um, of course what, what the hidden beauty is is, is learning, it's, it's, it's education. So I want to finish by giving a big thank you to all of our 12 uh, experts who joined us virtually uh, for our, our first webinar in the series today. Um, I will put up the, um, the link and the QR code that you can scan in order to get your uh, certificate. But Matt, I don't know if you want to jump in now and, and uh, handle any questions there might be. Yeah. Um... Well, thank you, Peter. That was that was fantastic. Um, I love the little bit of an Italian at the end. Uh, very, very poetic indeed. Um, we have a few questions. Most of the questions have been around certificates and recordings. So um, I'll let you handle that now. You're putting the link up for the certificate and a QR code. But yep. there were a few um, pedagogical questions that I thought were really good and really apropos. So and the first question is, how can I enhance creativity and learning L2 in my environment? Um, oh, difficult question. Um, it is I was hoping, I was I hoping believe, for easy questions. The, yeah, no, I started with a hard one. How can yeah, I enhance? I think, uh, I think it really depends on where you are um, and what, your, you know, what, what resources you have around you. Um, I don't just mean course books. I mean everything else that we use. Um, but I... I, I I don't think everybody's necessarily creative. I, I don't think it's a given. Um, and I think different people are creative in different ways. So I, I'm sort of avoiding the question. Um, but I think, I think as teachers, you know, everything we do is about stimulation and there are different ways that we can stimulate learners to be creative. And I think that depends very much on, on, on what you actually give them. Uh, you know, just giving students a, a piece of blank paper is probably not going to stimulate much creativity. Um, but give them a, a piece of paper with some um, circles on it and some boxes and some lines and and so on. Um, you know, that that will give that will that will stimulate students to start being more creative. I hope I hope that's answered the question. Yeah, I think that's a good start. Um, there's another question: How do I put myself? and my learners in the right frame of mind during this period? Um, Tricks or oh. tips that you have? I think, I think routine. I mean, certainly in my own situation with my own family and, uh, you know, I've obviously got family not here in different countries and I have a quite an elderly mother who lives alone and I've, I'm encouraging her to have a routine. I'm, I'm giving her little tasks to do every day. I've set her an alphabet project, actually. Every day she has to take a photograph of something, beginning with um, the letters of the alphabet. So she started with A a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think today she's on P. Uh, and she has to take a photograph every day of something, beginning with that letter, and she has to upload it to WhatsApp, and she has to send it to me. And um, it's now become a big part of her, her, of her daily routine. So I think... Um, I think getting students into a routine is, is extremely important. Uh, just because they're working from home remotely doesn't mean that you can't have the same uh, routine that, that you had uh, when you were teaching in the classroom. So I, I would say that's, that's probably the most important thing is, is setting routines. Great. Yep, I would agree with that, Peter. I think even, even as we're working remotely, I think getting up, taking a shower, putting the coffee in, putting the loaf of bread in the oven, as I, yep. as I said, earlier you know it all it all puts us in the right mindset yep, and yep. and allows us to focus um i think probably time for maybe one more question um okay. let me see here 
this is actually a good one. I think this is important. And, and there's a lot of great questions, so I do apologize. We're not going to get to all of them. Um, but please do continue to join um, these webinar sessions, and perhaps you'll be able to get your questions answered in another uh, session. But I think there's a great one that, that refers back to Plato's last quote. And why is there risk in discovery? What is the risk in discovery? I think, I think because um, discovery is about the unknown. If, if it was known to you, it wouldn't be a discovery. So I think um, that that's where the risk is. And of course, for some people, it's going to be more and, and, and less. And, and, and for, you know, some people enjoy taking risks. You know, one of our colleagues um, that works in the MENA team um, does deep sea cave diving. Now, for me, that's just a nightmare. I, could, I would never go underwater scuba diving in a cave it's just something i would never ever do I, I don't want to make that discovery but i'm okay to splash around in the water with you know um, a snorkel that that's fine so i i, I think i think there has to be uh, a degree of, of of discovery um and that that discovery will will um will, will create risk definitely yeah i think the unknown i think yeah. i think when you prepare yourself for that discovery you're, you're venturing into the unknown and there is always risk in that there is always a certain fear or a certain uh trepidation but uh but the beauty that comes out of it, it it really does you know give value to our to our learning to our lives so i think that's great um i'm gonna end it there uh, again apologies i know there's been tons dozens and dozens of questions but there's 1,727 people on this, so um, we couldn't really get to everybody, so I do apologize, but really, thank you again, Peter. Um, this has been a fantastic launch to this series. We have 12 more sessions delivered over the next two weeks. Please do go to the website, uh, register for the individual sessions. You can see the QR code now um, and the link to get your attendance. And I just encourage you to keep learning, keep listening, um, keep, keep close to this community that we have of learners, of students, of educators, of thought provoking sessions that we will be presenting. And yeah, stay safe, stay sane um, and keep learning. That would be how I would, I would finish up. Peter, any, any last thoughts for the crowd in the last minute? Uh, just a, a, a really big thank you for everybody for attending. I hope it's been useful. Um, and yeah, just please, please uh, keep yourself safe. And um, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be able to meet uh, face to face. But let's not knock the online. I think, I think you know, there's a, um, let, let's use this as, a, a, as, 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 a, as our own learning to understand that actually uh, online webinars are, are not such a bad thing. So, you know, maybe uh, blended learning is, is the way we should all be moving. Thanks again, everybody, and hope to see you all soon. Thank you all.